Well, good evening. Welcome to the 27th Annual Nimitz Lectureship. Thank you so much for coming tonight. My name is Captain Phil Rose. I am the Director of Military Affairs here at Cal and uh, also the Commanding Officer of the Naval ROTC Unit. It's the best job in the Navy. <laughs> uh, the Nimitz Lecture Series was established by endowment to invite prominent speakers to lecture and educate not only our students, but also our community on items of national interest and relevance. Since the establishment of the program in 1983, we've hosted a wide array of distinguished and nationally recognized public figures who have enriched us with their unique perspectives and expertise on an equally wide array of topics. Ladies and gentlemen, we have all have an obligation to be an informed public and uh, um, honored that you have come tonight. It's an honor and a privilege to welcome Mr. Tom Ricks as our 27th Nimitz lecturer. Mr. Ricks hails to us um, from Massachusetts originally and has an extensive personal and professional background perfectly suited for this venue. He grew up in New York, also spent time as a student in the American International School in Kabul, graduated from Yale, and after teaching in Hong Kong for two years and serving as an assistant editor with the Wilson Quarterly, was hired and spent 17 years with the Wall Street Journal, ultimately culminating in his position as the Pentagon correspondent for that publication. In 2000, he became the Washington Post's military correspondent, a post he held until 2008. He's a recipient of two Pulitzer Prizes, the first a team award in 2000 with the Wall Street Journal on a series of articles on how the U.S. military might adapt to new demands in the 21st century, and a second in 2002, another team award, this time with the Washington Post, for reporting about the beginning of the U.S. counteroffensive against terrorism. Mr. Ricks is an accomplished author and expert on military and foreign affairs. Notable books include Making the Corps, a book that chronicles recruit training for the United States Marine Corps, Fiasco, the American Military Adventure in Iraq, and most recently, The Gamble, General Petraeus and the American Military Adventure in Iraq, 2006 to 2008. He's a senior fellow with the Center of New American Security an independent and nonpartisan research institution that leads efforts to help inform and prepare the national security leaders of today and tomorrow. He also maintains a very popular foreign policy weblog or blog online. I think Mr. Ricks is uh, perfectly suited to be our Nimitz lecturer this week. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tom Ricks, our 2011 Nimitz lecturer. Good evening. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I just wish that I was really in California because you couldn't persuade me. It's rained the whole time since I arrived on Sunday. I uh, just want to begin with a couple of questions. Would you hold up your hand if you're affiliated with the military here? You guys aren't the cadets? Or? <laughs> okay. Um, would you hold up your hand if you were affiliated somehow with the university in some other capacity? And finally, would you hold up your hand if you are just from the general public? Oh, interesting cross-section. Well, I appreciate you're all coming tonight, given the rain out there. Um, I'm not sure I would have come to see me. <laughs> uh, final question. Hold up your hand if you know who this guy is. OK. I guarantee you, if there's one thing, you'll all know who he is by the time you walk out of here. Uh, I want to talk a little bit at the beginning about why I write books. I've written four. I'm in the middle of my fifth. I enjoy it enormously. But one thing that writing a book is, is consuming. It's all consuming. It takes up vast amounts of time, effort, and energy. I will occasionally awake in the middle of the night and realize I have been dreaming about something in my book. And I'll get up and start writing. Oh, I, you know. You know, when Westmerlin met with Abrams in the spring of 1970 on that issue, and make a note to myself on that. I don't write books because I have answers, at least at the beginning of them. 
I write books because I have questions. The process of writing a book, I find, is just going to so dominate your life that you have to be driven, at least I have to be driven, by a really compelling interest in figuring out the answer to something. For me, every book is in some way a mystery story, a detective novel. Why did this happen? Um, what is this problem? How can I under, come to understand this and explain it? After writing two books about Iraq, I came away wondering ultimately how our generals could have been so wrong there. And this is a line of thought that actually began for me in 2005. I had left Iraq. I was on a military staff ride of Sicily. We were studying the campaign of the summer of 1943, the first American landing in Europe in the war. And the culminating battle was in Troina, just north of, of the town of Enna in central Sicily. And I was standing there on the staff ride, and a retired colonel was explaining that day's action in this battle where the 1st Infantry Division had ultimately prevailed against the Germans in the culminating battle of the campaign. The 1st Infantry Division was commanded by Terry Allen, um, a really wonderful character I'll talk about, a little bit more about later. The most successful division commander the Army had in Europe for the first year of the war. At the end of the battle, Allen having won it, he was fired by Omar Bradley. And that really lit a fuse for me. How could that be? Here I was just coming from Iraq in 05. We had generals who were screwing it up to a fare the well. Nobody was firing them. Why in World War II would a successful general have been fired when nowadays nobody got fired? And that was the sort of the beginning question for me that, that really nagged at me for several years. In addition, it was clear to me that the problem was not the raw material. The generals I knew, and I knew many of them, were hardworking, determined, courageous. Most of them were smart, not all of them. Uh, generally, what people would say, he's a good guy. Um, I, had, I was actually the first reporter ever to go to the Army's charm school, they called it, for new brigadiers. Um, it's, the, it's a week at that time, it was at Fort Leavenworth, and all the new active duty reserve and guard generals were sent there to learn how to be a general. And I had asked, uh, Dennis Reimer, then the Army Chief of Staff, if I could attend it. And he was trying to work at new forms of transparency, and he said, okay. And it was funny because it was a room about this size, filled to capacity. And the first day there, I'm sitting there, and like, I'm in the only seat that has an empty seat on either side of it. <laughs> and you could just see these guys, so, you know, 25 years waiting to become a general, and there's a reporter sitting there next to me, nuh uh. Well, about halfway through that day, General Reimer showed up and sat down next to me. Hey, Tom, he says. And suddenly, it's like Alexa Hente. If you remember those, oh, you know, we go out into, for the coffee break, and all, everybody suddenly wants to talk to me. Like, this is the guy the chief of staff is sitting next to. So in that, in that time in Charm School, I really came to know a lot of these guys. Uh, for example, one of my classmates was Raymond Odierno, who later went on to command in, in, a, in Iraq under General Petraeus. <clears throat> and I think um, is going on even to other four-star positions in the future. They were a terrific bunch of people, but they didn't strike me as being particularly successful. So the more research I did, the more I studied this, the more puzzled I became, and eventually realized, okay, the only way I'm going to get this out of my head is to write a book about it. Eventually, I find myself reaching back to George C. Marshall. And in the process, George C. Marshall became one of my real heroes. Uh, George C. Marshall is almost forgotten today. If people know of him, it's really only because of the Marshall Plan, which ironically was not something he did while in uniform, but something he did while as Secretary of State. Uh, it won him the Nobel Prize for Peace, the first soldier ever to win the Nobel Peace Prize. But he's not remembered particularly for what he did in the previous 10 years. George C. Marshall became Army Chief of Staff on September 1, 1939. Now, you guys are smart Berkeley students. Anybody know what happened that day? World War II really begins. Germany invades Poland. What a first day at the office. Now, <laughs> 
Marshall actually knew this was coming. He'd been acting chief of staff for several months, so it wasn't like he had to come in and actually figure out where the telephone was. Nonetheless, he actually was sworn in as the Army Chief of Staff on September 1, 1939. He later wrote that the military he commanded was, quote, not even a third-rate military power. The Army, then including the, what is now the Air Force, had 190,000 people. It had a handful of tanks. It had a handful of bombers, most of them antiques. And it really was not a very effective force. Uh, it was smaller than the Bulgarian military. When he stepped down as Army Chief of Staff, he had presided over an army of nine million people. He had presided over the transformation of the US Army from what he would call a fourth-rate power to the world's preeminent military power. He had, on his watch, seen the development of a modern, mechanized, mobile military that is very similar to what you have now. In fact, a lot of the same weapons. Uh, as I understand it, the 50 caliber, uh, every infantryman's favorite weapon for the protection it can give you, is basically the same weapon they fielded in World War II. Marshall focused a lot on generalship. One of the real joys I've had in my book research is going back and really delving into these guys' papers, sitting there and reading maps uh, with, that have patents writing on them in and, and pencil, tactical maps from Tunisia, from Sicily. And one of the things I read was a lot of documents about how he prepared to take office as Army Chief of Staff. He knew World War II was coming. He knew we were going to come in on our heels. And so the first thing he did in May 1939 was get on the USS Nashville, a cruiser, and go to South America. Why? Because he wanted to secure lines of communication across the Central Atlantic or the South Atlantic, knowing that we wouldn't be able to get into Europe. He took with him a smart young colonel he liked named Matthew Ridgway. They sat on the bow of the Nashville for 10 days as they steamed towards Rio de Janeiro, with Marshall talking through what he intended to do as chief of staff to Ridgway. He admired Ridgway's managerial ability, leadership ability. And what he told Ridgway was, I'm going to clean out the general officers. I'm going to retire them. They are old and in the way. And one thing he'd seen in World War I was that Pershing, the American commander in France, had to spend much too much time firing generals in France. Marshall was determined that he'd fire them before they ever got overseas. The first thing he did was retire about 200 senior colonels and generals. He called them in and said, thank you very much for your interest in national defense. We are, you are not going to be leading troops in combat. You are too old. This is a soft-looking guy with a real hard edge to inside him. The second thing he did was tell a lot of guys, you're going to train divisions, but you're not, not necessarily take them overseas. My overseas commanders are going to be able to chop off an all-division commanders. And Eisenhower and MacArthur ultimately both did reject people that Marshall proposed. Even protégés of Marshall just got hammered sometimes. There is a myth that Marshall had a black book that he kept and wrote down the names of. I've actually researched this and I've checked this with historians. Marshall did not keep a black book of people he thought would make good officers. I think he, he really didn't need to. He knew them all. It wasn't that big an army. If you look at who he had on his staff when he was running the infantry school at Fort Benning, well, there's Joe Stilwell. He's the tactics expert. There's Omar Bradley. He's teaching machine guns. You know, he knew, he knew who these guys were already. But there was a list that Marshall had, and the funny thing is, it's almost unknown. I came across it because I read something, a book that almost nobody knows about. I don't know why. Marshall famously refused to write a memoir of World War II. Henry Luce, the owner of Time Life, offered him a million dollars. Marshall had no money. Henry Luce offered a million dollars, which is real cash back then to write his memoirs, and Marshall said, no, I would embarrass too many people, and refused to write his memoirs. 
Never did. But in some idle moments in the 1920s, he wrote his memoirs of World War I. And in those memoirs and in those letters, he kind of sorted out what he'd learned in World War I as a fast rising young staff colonel, ultimately as the aide to Pershing, and what he thought the requirements of generalship were. So I found this list, and this is Marshall's real list, not the phony black book thing they talk about. He wrote this in November 1920, the essential qualities of a general. They are good common sense, professionally educated, physically strong, cheerful and optimistic, energetic, extreme loyalty, and determined. What that list is not is Clausewitzian. You'll see nothing that really reflects Clausewitz, the great Prussian philosopher of war in there. Clausewitz talks about things like the ability to have, to sense the battlefield, uh, to kind of have a vision of the battlefield, to understand it. it what it is, is a very American list. Uh, and Marshall consciously tailored this list to fit the historical and strategic circumstances of the United States. He said, look, a cautious, quiet general might serve in other militaries. For example, the British historically have had a small army, a stronger navy, so a British general probably is strategically wise to conserve his forces, to, always, to not give battle, to evade, to, to preserve your force. Um, but for America, there were other circumstances. First of all, he said, America will always produce, pursue what he called a policy of unpreparedness for war. We will never go to war prepared. Don't complain about it, get used to it, was his point. It's like the weather. You know, you don't, you don't hear you know, officers saying, oh, I can't go out, it's raining. Well, at least some, most of you did. Uh, what you do is learn to live with it. So he said, inevitably, we will go into war ill-trained, poorly equipped. That means almost always we will go into demoralizing early battles in our wars. So he said, the requirement is, and I'm quoting here, for the dashing, optimistic, and resourceful type, quick to estimate, with relentless determination, and who possessed, in addition, a fund of sound common sense, which operated to prevent gross errors due to rapidity of decision and action. The opposite sort of leader, he wrote, was the man who was given to pessimism, to saying, you know, we could get our butts kicked here. He said that officer needed to be found and cut out of the force like a cancer. These officers were, he said, quote, quickly infected. Oh, these officers, when put in charge of units, quickly infected their units with the same spirit and grew ineffective unless a more suitable commander is found and given charge. The Marshall template worked really well in World War II. It lives on today, but it doesn't work as well. And this takes me to the key point of what I'm gonna talk about here. It has lost one essential element. That element was relief. Successful commanders were kept in place and promoted. Unsuccessful commanders were relieved and moved into other jobs. This was the way they ran not only the, the general officer corps, but really all the entire officer corps in World War II. Without that factor, I think the Marshall template is somewhat crippled. If you don't punish failure, you cannot reward success because you're leaving failures in place. When you leave fails, failures in place, you create an atmosphere, a culture of mediocrity in your entire officer corps. Rather than everybody driving to the top, people tend to drive toward the middle. If you're not punished for failure, then why take risk? Why seek success? Keep your head down. And the policy of rotation of officers that we've had in, in the, from the late Korean War on, Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, just reinforces that tendency to drive to the middle. And what you get is an officer corps built for stalemate, not for victory. It is forgotten by most people, though I hope not the people World War II began with a wave of firings. It was a, a kind of 
cleaning, house cleaning across the military that would astonish people if it occurred today. Two weeks after Pearl Harbor, the two top commanders in the Pacific, Admiral Kimmel and General Short, were fired. Kimmel, by the way, anybody know who replaced him? Nimitz! Yeah, come on. That's a, it's a gimme, guys. Uh, he was replaced at the end of December 1941 by Chester Nimitz. Also gone from Honolulu was Major General Frederick Martin, who had been the air commander under General Short. On the European front, the Americans banged into the Germans in North Africa. Not long afterward, the senior tactical commander for the Americans, Major General Lloyd Fredendahl, is canned. Meanwhile, back in Washington, Marshall is fin finishing up his winning of the officer corps. Of all the senior leaders of the Army who led the Army in the 1930s, who did the Louisiana maneuvers, for example, only one, in addition to MacArthur, who was really out of the Army during that period, he was in the Philippines, only one got command, uh, General Kruger. None of the other senior commanders survived into combat command. During World War II, about 165 men commanded divisions in combat. During World War II, under this policy of relief, 16 division commanders were relieved. And remember, these are the people who have already made it through the first two hurdles. They weren't winnowed out. They trained up units and were allowed to bring them overseas. They were in combat and then got relieved, these 16 guys, plus four or five corps commanders, depending on how you count it. Yet, and this is the key point, what makes swift relief work? Relief is not a terminal act in World War II. It is not a career render. Sometimes it hardly even slows down. It's a speed bump for some guys. Uh, several generals, at least four, were relieved from division command in Europe and got another division uh, within a year. One Brigadier General, Hanging Sang Williams, was not only demoted to colonel, um, he, he, was, he was actually fired, demoted to colonel, and retired many years later as a three-star general. Another colonel was escorted from the battlefield in Normandy under armed escort, wound up retiring as a two-star. So there is hope there. What got you relieved by Marshall? Well, all those characteristics, if you didn't meet them, you probably weren't even going to get the job in the first place. But once you had a general slot under Marshall, what got you relieved? First and foremost, not being a team player. He was insistent on this. This is about the team. It's not about George Marshall, certainly. It's not about you. Early in the war, he heard that one of his weirder generals, Brigadier General Simon Bolivar Buckner, commanding in Alaska, had rather foolishly written a poem making fun of the Navy, asserting that it was afraid to operate in the Bering Sea, and then read it aloud to his naval counterpart, who then complained to Admiral King, who went storming into Marshall, and said, what are you going to do about this? Marshall seriously considered firing Buckner, ultimately decided not to, left him in place, and he was promoted to another job. After Buckner moved on, a new admiral Repay the favor by relieving an army general up there, Eugene Landrum, who himself, I'm sorry, he relieved an arm, army, another army general, Brown, who was replaced by Eugene Landrum, who then gets relieved a year later in Normandy. Buckner goes on, meanwhile, to the Pacific, where one of his big jobs is, is to look into one of the most famous firings of the war when a marine general fired an army general. And this is really confusing because they have the same name. It's Marine General H.M. Howling Mad Smith, fired uh, an army general, Ralph Smith, who commanded the 27th Division. And Buckner led the army investigation, which concluded, of course, that H.M. That, uh, Smith was wrong. Actually, H.M. Smith was, was dead right. Uh, the unit was slow. Buckner, by the way, has two other claims to fame. His father was the guy who commanded the fort that U.S. Grant took in the Civil War. And, um, it was Fort Donaldson and Henry, and <laughs> I really like this because 
It's when Grant got the nickname Unconditional Surrender. Um, Grant sends in a note to this guy. It's like a West Point classmate saying, um, surrender. And the guy wrote back, what are your terms? And Grant wrote back, none. I, I propose to move upon your works immediately. Buckner writes back, sir, you are no gentleman, which is answered by some gunfire. <laughs> uh, Buckner went on to become the highest ranking American officer killed by enemy fire in World War II. Uh, he was standing on a hillside in Okinawa wearing a shiny helmet with his three stars on it. A Marine officer asked him to take off his helmet because it might attract artillery fire. Nonsense, says Buckner, and that's his last words because then an artillery shell landed next to him. He was replaced by Joseph Stilwell, who himself had been relieved of command in October 1944 in China. It is a merry-go-round of reliefs in World War II. It's, it's very difficult even to sort it out historically. But I hear you guys up there, your historically informed cadets saying, but what about Eisenhower? He made mistakes, why wasn't he fired? Dwight Eisenhower was an anomaly. And by the way, for all you who ever get stuck in an XO position, Remember that Dwight D. Eisenhower, I think in the spring of 1940, was still a lieutenant colonel who was XO of an infantry regiment in the state of Washington. So promotions can come along quickly. Marshall had singled out Eisenhower, knowing that when we would be going to war, we would have to fight overseas and in a coalition. He wanted a guy who was a team player who could keep his temper, even though he had one, and would work relentlessly within a coalition. And he knew a lot of officers. There was a real anti-British streak in the US Army. Uh, he knew a lot of officers wouldn't be able to do that. He knew Ike would, and so he had Ike brought along very quickly. But Eisenhower himself um, actually thought at one point that he was came close to being fired. In late 1943 in Algeria, there's a very murky affair called the Darlan Affair. Uh, a kind of fascist uh, French admiral that Eisenhower kind of put in place. The guy was a Vichyite. He'd been playing footsie with the Nazis. For, for Ike, it was a matter of expediency, but it caused a huge political fuss back here. And at one point, Ike wrote to his son that he might be removed. Um, and he said, if it happens, don't worry about it. It's, 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 th there's a larger cause here. It is true, though, that the lesson of Eisenhower a lot of other four stars and some three stars is the higher you rose in the war, the less likely you were to be relieved. Partly, there just weren't a lot of other people who could step into those jobs. Coalition warfare also increased the likelihood of relief. And by this, I mean genuine coalitions, not the phony things we've had in Iraq and Afghanistan, where basically they're window dressing and we're not really operating with them as equals. We were working with the British as equals at the beginning of the war, really operating with them as inferiors. They had a lot of contempt for us, including for Marshall and Eisenhower. In coalition warfare, not only do you have to operate to the satisfaction of your own chain of command, your own leadership, but also to that of the coalition. Several generals were fired at the behest of the British during World War II. Uh, one was, for example, Orla Orlando Ward, commanded the first armored division in North Africa. Ike was pretty happy with him. The British said, we're not. The next day, Ike fired him, sent him back. And this was a guy who had been secretary of Marshall's general staff at the, at the outset of the war. This is kind of a Marshall protege. Yet again, combat relief was not the end of the career. By the following year, Orlando Ward commanded another combat division, the 20th Armored, and at the end of the war, he briefly commanded the Fifth Corps. Meditating on the Allied victory in Tunisia a couple of months after that firing, remember, the Allied victory in Tunisia uh, is the, in the spring of 43, is, is the first Allied triumph in the West after a series of defeats in the West and in Singapore and so on. Eisenhower wrote down some of his initial conclusions about what he'd seen as a senior commander. This is what Eisenhower wrote. What works, he said. Immediate and continuous loyalty to the concept of unity and to allied commanders is basic to victory. The instant such commanders lose the confidence of either government 
or of the majority of their principal subordinates, they must be relieved. This is his conclusion from the first campaign. He later wrote that swift relief was the price of giving autonomy to battlefield commanders, of being led by intent, which is what we try to do, rather than micromanagement, which is what we often fall into. Why is that? Why is relief connected to not being micromanaged? I thought about this, and he went on to write, the American doctrine has always been to assign a theater commander a mission, to provide him with a definite amount of force, and then to interfere as little as possible in the execution of his plans. If results obtained by the field commander become unsatisfactory, the proper procedure is not to advise, admonish, and harass him, but to replace him. The bottom line is in World War II, you basically had 60 to 90 days to either be successful, be killed, or be relieved. And frankly, your chain of command really didn't care which one it was. You needed to perform. But even successful commanders could be booted. At the outset, I mentioned Terry de la Mesa Allen. Terry Allen, terrible Terry, Terry they called him. Commander of the 1st Infantry Division, Sicily, summer of 1943. You want to talk about old school? Allen is as old school as they come. He was a hard-drinking cavalryman from the frontier west. Famously once raced a cowboy across Texas on horses. They're from, I think, from uh, San Antonio to Dallas. Uh, and he did it like two hours faster. It was the army against the cowboy. And all the newspapers covered this in the 1930s. Uh, he liked to play craps with his soldiers. He was super old school. He was actually born in a fort in the Old West. He did not fit in with the Marshall, Eisenhower, Bradley template, the new corporate type general, the cool, calm, cheerful team player. He was a cavalryman. And one place it was dangerous to be a cavalryman was in the US Army in Europe in World War II. This was an infantry show. They didn't trust cavalrymen. They all remembered the lesson of Gettysburg. Jeb Stewart ran away up to Carlisle and left Lee blind. They wanted guys who were tied in on their lines. You could lose the war they thought by being too aggressive, taking too many risks, you couldn't lose it by being too cautious. And that's what Omar Bradley specialized in. His middle name was Caution. So Alan does a terrific job in Tunisia. My favorite moment in Tunisia is one day he gets an order to attack at dawn. And he says, why wait till dawn? I'll attack at midnight. He attacks at midnight, gets to his, the uh, position he's supposed to be in and um, his forces are up ahead of him. And George Patton shows up and starts screaming at him in his little squeaky voice. Because Patton had a really genuinely squeaky voice. What are you doing sitting here? You're supposed to be attacking right now. Alan looks up and says, I'm already in my position. You know, I took all the, all the assigned spots. So he kind of out Patton, Patton there. <laughs> At Sicily, US forces came very close to being thrown back onto the beach the day after the landing. Alan again got his forces together. After a hard day of fighting, at one point, his infantrymen ducking down into holes and letting the panzers roll over their heads. They had, um, they got, the German tanks got as close as a kilometer from the beach that the landings were occurring on. The first infantry division under Terry Allen stopped them. Stopped them again because the Germans were marshalling for an attack at dawn and Terry said, let's attack at 4 a.m. And he caught them as they were marshalling. So, Sicily, early August, he's had a hard six weeks of fighting. He wins at Troina, and Omar Bradley fires him. It's just amazing to me. And he was replaced by Major General Clarence Eubner, who fit the Marshall template perfectly. Eubner also needed a job because he'd been fired as Deputy Chief of Staff to a British General, Harold Alexander, just a few weeks earlier. Again, though, at Terry Allen gets another command. He's back in combat a year later. He trains and commands the 104th Division. Takes it all the way from Normandy into Germany. The real question to me about Sicily is not why Terry Allen was fired. It's why Patton wasn't. And I still haven't quite figured this out. The closeness to Ike is very important in the case of Patton. 
Remember at the beginning of the war, Patton outranks Eisenhower. Ike writes to him and says, I hear you're getting an armored division. Can I get a brigade? And Patton kind of tells him, well, I'd love to give you a brigade fellow, but you're a great staff officer. You can be my chief of staff. Also, Eisenhower knew that Patton had one great skill. He was lousy in the defense. He was, was not good at coordinating, but he was great in the pursuit. And Eisenhower knew by mid-42 that within two or three years, they probably would be chasing the Germans across Germany. And that's basically why he preserved Patton in his career. Patton, by the way, makes fun of Bradley and Ike for all the relieving they did. He said they're very bad about relieving guys too often. On the other hand, Patton didn't pass along the favor. In the end of 1944, he fires John Wood, actually a very well respected and admired division commander, commander of the 4th Armored Division, fired him. Said, you're sick, go home. There were tons of other reliefs in World War II. Lucky for you, I'm not going to discuss them all. <laughs> but the names briefly, Dolly, Lucas, Milliken. The relief of division commanders in Normandy is extraordinary. McKelvey gets relieved after three days in combat. Landrum and Watson get relieved a few weeks later. The other thing I'm not going to talk about is the generals who should have been relieved but weren't. They both have names beginning with M, MacArthur and Marshall. Uh, at one point at the end of 44, Eisenhower drafted a cable asking for the relief of Montgomery but didn't send it. I suspect he drafted it and showed it around because he knew he really couldn't get Montgomery fired. The point here, though, to remember, the takeaway is that relief was very common. The more common it was, the less extreme it seems. It becomes a normal management tool. Hiring and firing are the two basic tools. They use both of them a lot. Relief did not mean you were bad, did not mean you were cowardly. It could just mean you were out of step with your commander or your allies. It most of all was not terminal. So what went wrong? My hypothesis is that the Marshall model, the relief, which was a tradition in American history, Marshall didn't invent it. Reliefs mark the American Revolution, the Civil War, Lincoln's search for a general, World War I and World War II. We even have a bunch of reliefs, five division commanders relieved by Ridgeway in Korea early in 1951. By late Korea, though, they, they stopped relieving people. And I think there's a couple of reasons here. The first is, it is more difficult to relieve commanders in unpopular wars. The second is, if you have rotation, which they began in Korea in 52, then the sense is, why well, fire the guy? By the time you figured out, he's just not going to get any better. He's going to be going home soon. In World War II, there was no rotation home. Remember, the road, the road home went through Berlin, was the saying. But rotation started in 50, um, 51. Was it? Yeah, 51. And we've had it in Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Once you have one-year tours, relief goes way down. In Vietnam, Westmoreland comp com compounds this error by doing six-month command tours. An officer will be out for a year, six-month command, six-month staff. And because guys are also getting killed, and wounded, promoted into other jobs. Uh, you had churning in the ranks of command. The other day I was reading about a guy uh, in the AmeriCal division, a particularly rough division, who had seven company commanders in six months. When you have that kind of churning, when the officers don't know their subordinates, you really increase micromanagement. This is one reason I think we saw the hovering of battalion brigade commanders in helicopters in the Vietnam War. You don't know these people, you don't trust them. The final nail in the tradition of relief came um, in the Vietnam War. The 1st Infantry Division, Terry Allen's old division, has a commander very much like Terry Allen named William Depew, veteran of Normandy. He's commanding the 1st ID in 1966. In one year, he relieves 11 battalion commanders or battalion equivalents. Harold K. Johnson, the chief of staff of the army, shows up in his hooch at Christmas. Why are you firing all my battalion commanders, Harold Johnson says. You're supposed to train them. The assistant of a division commander pipes up and says, funny, I thought we were supposed to fight them. 
Despite this, Depew did not get fired because they didn't fire generals anymore. In the entire Vietnam War, I'm aware of only one division commander who got fired. And it was not the division commander who presided over me lie, by the way. He just went on to be superintendent of West Point before he was charged. So to wind up, when you lose the tool of relief, you wind up with a lot of hardworking, determined, loyal, cheerful, risk-averse conformist. I suspect you could draw an intellectual straight line from Omar Bradley at Omaha Beach to Norman Schwarzkopf's initial plan, the 1991 Gulf War, to Tommy Frank's unimaginative plan for Iraq, Iraq in, the, in the spring of 2003. In all three cases, you could describe their approach in a few short words, hey diddle diddle, straight up the middle. All three generals, by the way, also focus much too much on the initial assault and much too little on what came after it, to the detriment of their forces. So is the Marshall model dead? I think we are close to it. No one gets fired anymore, except for four-star generals. Why? Because they don't rotate, and they get fired by civilians. So my concluding thought is, if the Army won't fire generals, civilians will. In fact, the, the Korean War is marked now in our memories most for the firing of MacArthur. That begins really the tradition of the firing of generals. And it almost comes exactly the same moment that we stopped, that the generals were stopping to fire themselves. So I think my final thought for you, it is time to restore the tradition of relief. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ricks. We actually have some uh, time for questions and answers, so uh, if you're interested in uh, asking Mr. Ricks some questions, uh, we've got some microphones here. We'll pass them uh, up, the, uh, up the aisle, so please feel free. Uh, I also want to remind everybody that upon conclusion of this, uh, this evening, there will be a uh, reception at the Women's Faculty Club immediately following. So with that, we'll take your qu questions. I'm sorry, what was that? Oh, still oh I'm sorry. The Berkeley. Sit. The Faculty Club. Uh, the Faculty Club. Apologize. Uh, <laughs> okay. I want you to fire away with your questions or even just your responses, comments, and denunciations. Uh, I've only got one request. I used to be a reporter. I've got very thick skin. So don't try to not hurt my feelings. Thank you for your comments, sir. My name is Ronald Winter. Hold up your hand. I can't see where you are. Okay. And... Uh, Talking in regard to firing and relief, in that regard, uh, in our current situation in Afghanistan, uh, did McChrystal put himself in a position to get fired, or did was he fired by incompetence, or what? Your opinion, please. Uh, you all heard the question? Okay. Um, now, is your question, did McChrystal want to go, or... Is your question, did Mac, is it McChrystal's fault? He set himself up to go. Well, I don't think he was trying to get out. But I always thought that um, McChrystal had all in the war fighting ability than David Petraeus and more, but none of the political savvy. Uh, Petraeus really knows the reporters he's, he's talking to. My impression was McChrystal didn't. Didn't know who he was talking to. Um, my attitude when you're embedded is you gotta tell people, you know, is this on the record or something. You can't be around people all the time and expect them to be on the record all the time. And what happened was this Rolling Stone reporter is drinking beers with these guys in Paris on, the, on a diplomatic trip on their flight home. And he's just writing everything down and it showed up in print. There's never been an allegation that he had violated ground rules. That means that McChrystal and the people around him were indisciplined. Um, and, and additionally, that the Public Affairs Office failed utterly to brief his commander on who you're dealing with. Uh, the job of a good Public Affairs Officer is know who these reporters are. 
know what their reputations are, know whether you can trust these people. Thank you. You're welcome. If you cadets and middies don't start asking questions, I'm going to call on you. So. Um, speaking of firing, in a nutshell, Abu Ghraib, who should have been fired and why? I'm glad you mentioned that because whenever I say nobody gets fired anymore, it's like I was speaking at 411 where somebody says, what about Janice Karpinski? Uh, Janice Karpinski, for those who forgot, was the Army Reserve uh, Brigadier who presided over the Abu Ghraib mess. And she was about as outside the club as you can be and still have a general star on your shoulder. She was a reservist, she was from a non-combat arm, and she was a female. Uh, I thought the guy she was reporting to, and I'm, I'm blanking out his name, Wojciechowski, uh, Army General, should have been fired and Sanchez should have been fired. Everybody knew Sanchez should have been fired. Sanchez was a big mistake. This is actually the joke of Donald Rumsfeld's memoir. Is he sort of says, hey, how did Sanchez wind up in Iraq? Well, geez, you were Secretary of Defense. You might have asked. Uh, I know for a fact, I know of one senior army general who went to John Abizade and said, don't put Sanchez in there. He's a lightweight. He's the most junior three-star in the army. He is not capable of this job. An opinion, by the way, I utterly endorse, having been embedded with Sanchez going into Iraq and sitting in his morning brief every morning and thinking, geez, this guy is a jumped up battalion commander who doesn't understand what he's getting into. He prided himself, and I asked him one day about this, he prided himself in chewing out junior officers in the briefings. Yesterday you said that battalion was missing 24 tires, today you said 22. Did you find two tires? I thought, my God, this is not the way you take over a country. You know, he's doing it, you know, probably the Brigade XO's job. And so he was just a big mistake. So I thought they probably, in an alternate universe, universe had we had relief, quick movement, and it did, wasn't politically embarrassing, I could see a scenario in the spring of 04 where they looked around and said, you know, this is what they would have done in World War II. Of all the division commanders, who's done a decent job here? Hey, that Petraeus guy up north. No, he can't stand him. He's an intellectual. He likes reporters. He, you know, PhD from Princeton. I mean, three strikes, man. But he's successful. This is, for example, what the Army did with Joe Collins in World War II. Smart young guy. They put him out in Guadalcanal. Does a good job. MacArthur says, ah, he's, he's too young to be promoted to Corps Command. Collins flies back to the United States, walks into Marshall's office and says, get me out of Pacific. I ain't working for MacArthur. Now, Marshall and MacArthur could stand each other. And MacArthur underst Marshall understood this perfectly. They put Collins in Europe, where he became the best corps commander, the guy they constantly relied on, for example, for the breakthrough at Saint Lo, um, and ultimately becomes Army Chief of Staff, succeeding whoever. I can't remember. Is he seed Bradley? No. But yeah, I think he must have succeeded Bradley, Eisenhower, Bradley, Collins, in about 47. Um, so I thought the whole chain of command could have been different. Uh, had you done that with Petraeus, I think the war would have been different. Um, but you didn't have an, a structure that was geared to that. It would have been seen. It would have seemed too turbulent to do that sort of thing. Who was the guy they brought from Guantanamo Bay over? Yeah, I've forgotten his name. Um, Wasn't well, he brought over specifically because they wanted to change the attitude? Well, the funny thing was, it was sort of like. We should do something. Let's get some Gitmo interrogation techniques. You know what you needed at Abu Ghraib? You needed things like thoughtful oversight. The Abu Ghraib prison was right on the seam between the 82nd Airborne base to the west and some other guys on the east. The MPs there, this junky reserve unit, uh, had no heavy firepower. They weren't patrolling on their perimeter. Um, insurgents were coming right up to them and just mortaring them and shooting at them. They were totally out of control of the situation. They didn't have a lot of mobility or firepower. Um, General Swanick commanded the 82nd Airborne. I've got some problems with him otherwise, but to his credit, one day he shows up at Abu Ghraib and says, to, you know, Janice, what's going on here? And she says, I just, I'm getting hammered. And he said, fine. And he puts out some patrols and he sort of clears out that seam there. But um, it was just a really lousy situation. There's just a huge amounts of inattention. 
And a humma humma belief, if we pretend, if, you know, if we all hold hands and pretend things are good, they'll be good. And that's a basic failure in command. Clausewitz says the first and really only task of the commander is to understand the nature of the conflict in which he was engaged. I would argue that we didn't have that understanding on the ground in Iraq until about December 2006, which is a long damn time to fight. That's longer than we fought World War II. Oh, good. Courage. Uh, good evening, sir. I'm Midshipman Ledesma from UC Davis. Um, I had a question. You've talked a lot about the um, Army especially, but the Navy had a large number of uh, CO firings or commanding officer firings. I wish if you could talk about that because it did seem like quite a lot and that maybe um, if, if there's a difference with the way the different forces are handling that situation. Um, I have not followed the Navy stuff as closely. I mean, I do see it and notice it right about it in my blog, but I haven't done a lot of work looking into it like I've been steeping myself in the situation with Army generals for the last three and a half years, um, and really the last 10 years. First of all, there is a very di different naval tradition of command and relief. Um, but even that has, has changed somewhat. I always like the fact that in World War II, two members of the Joint Chiefs have been court-martialed in their youth. Uh, Van de Griff and King. And I think Halsey had as well, hadn't he? Uh, it was not a career ender. You, you know, you took, you took the, uh, the, the lick and, and kept on moving. Uh, I generally think relief of commanders is a good thing. There's another person, you know, if you really do care about your enlisted uh, more than you care about your, the happiness of your office, officer corps, you will get rid of bad people. This comes up in World War II a lot with Marshall, when somebody comes and like some congressman complains constantly, he's getting, why, why was so-and-so removed? And he writes back again and again, this is a democracy, and the enlisted count for more in my mind than the officer corps. I am not gonna let soldiers get killed just to help some officer's career along. Um, so I think the Navy has lost a little bit of that, but it's still got a good, strong tradition of relief. My one asterisk on it is um, all these reliefs seem to be in surface warfare, except maybe recently the carrier, the carrier guys. And I do worry about this phrase you hear sometimes, swoes eat their young. Um, and I do worry about a cultural problem in the Navy with that. Time for one more question? What are we? Okay, two more. We're gonna get an army question here. I can't see what. So you mentioned you were hoping that the army would start, you know, bringing in this, you know, bring kind of firing of, of generals or other officers if necessary. Do you feel in general that the army is changing and adapting to the situation that they're facing in Iraq or no? It's a good question. The answer, short answer is no, I don't. What happened after Vietnam is the army had a magnificent rebuilding. They really revised the force and, and how it was trained, how it was equipped, how it was prepared ethically to think about what it did. The one thing they did not do, and I blame William DePew for this, they did not revise generalship. They basically built this powerful new body and slapped a rotten old head on it. And they did not revisit the failures of generalship in, World, in Vietnam and really even to this day have not. Uh, how could we do this differently? Uh, their argument was, we did great, um, but the media, the politicians, and the South Vietnamese all screwed, it, screwed us up. That is not the case. Um, there, were a lot, there was a lot of bad generalship in, in Vietnam. And so I think the Army has never really dealt with that. The Army has adapted a lot in the last 10 years, but it has not really changed how it thinks about generalship. Um, in fact, if anything, it's gotten, I think, a bit worse because people are so worn out um, by constant tours. The professional military education at the war college level, I think, has gotten uh, kind of bad. Uh, what you would hope is, at that level, guys would learn clinical thinking. And instead, they're exhausted. They come in, 
And they really just, all they want to do is kind of try to you know, rehabilitate the marriage, take care of the family, catch their breath, and get ready to go back out again. Uh, so I've got some real, real worries about that. Okay, this is going to be the last question, so it's going to be a good one. Good evening, Sir Mitchum, second class Ray from UC Berkeley. Uh, sir, it seems kind of counterintuitive when you were saying that um, the Americans' failure to, uh, or our current failure to fire our general officers um, would lead to a more conservative uh, group of general officers less willing to take risks. Um, like, my gut reaction was that um, firing more people would make people less likely to, you know, go against, the, go against the grain and whatnot. Could you just elaborate on what you meant by that? Sure. Counterintuitive is Berkeley talk for wrong. <laughs> no. 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 You're actually, you're right, because the proper word is counterintuitive. It does seem counterintuitive. Uh, this is the situation. When nobody gets fired, there's no incentive to take risk. Uh, if you could basically just get in, get out, not cause any waves, and if that's going to be just as good as the guy who, who goes out and takes a huge risk, a lot of people are going to veer towards not taking risk. Uh, I had long conversations with Petraeus about this when I was writing the gamble. And one of the themes he brought to his commander's meetings was take some freaking risk around here. Stick your head out. And everybody has to do it together because otherwise all you get is one nail sticking up um, and you get defeated in detail. You really need everybody to take risk together. And that's what you got in the spring of 07 in Iraq, the, the so-called surge. It really wasn't that many more troops, but it was a really different attitude, which is we're all going to go out there and we're going to get hit hard. And the spring of 07 was the bloodiest phase of the war. I remember, I think it was May of 07, they lost 215 soldiers. Um, which is a lot in that war, and especially at that, that late in the war. I remember seeing Petraeus in May 07, and he just looked drawn. Now, of course, it turns out he had cancer at the time as well, but he didn't know that. Um, he, he really just looked wiped out. And it was the only time, the whole time I was running the gamble, that he lost his temper with me and, and basically threw me out of his office. And I, after I went to his schedule and I said, look, I, I kind of looked at the schedule and I said, Please do not schedule my one-hour interviews with Petraeus between a one-hour VTC with the president and a one-hour VTC with Admiral Fallon. <laughs> this is just not a good time slot in his life. <laughs> and so they, they didn't do it after that. Um, if there's no reward for taking risk, people won't. Uh, why, why, why would you? So what you want to do is skew your incentive structure towards general risk-taking, prudential risk-taking, not, not wildly aggressive risk-taking. I would actually say more of the type of Patton. Uh, Patton was crazy in a lot of ways, but he was not a crazy warfighter, except at the end of the war when he did this goofy mission to rescue his son-in-law uh, and got a battalion wiped out. Um, he understood his enemy and he took a lot of risk and he understood the enemy is almost always going to be as tired as you. If you go the extra mile frequently, that's the measure that wins you victory. Thank you very much.